Yesterday's game underscored the importance that the starting rotation battle has over every other position battle that the Reds have. We'll explain why on today's Locked On Reds. You are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Reds. Thanks for making Locked On Reds your first listen of the day. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and we are free and available on all podcasting platforms. I'm your host, Stephen Offenbaker, alongside Jeff Carr, and we are diehard baseball fans. We have a passion for the Cincinnati Reds, and we have taken our love of the game, our passion for baseball and for this team, and we have turned that passion into information for you. On today's podcast, we are going to look at which position battles out in Goodyear are the most important for the Reds. We're going to lay out who the contestants, so to speak, are for each of the outfield battles. And we are going to look at a possible trade opportunity that the Reds may or may not be able to take advantage of uh, in uh, regards to a particular injury for a, a National League second baseman. So, Jeff, let's start with the starting pitching and that particular position battle because as we saw against the Dodgers, uh, good starting pitching can make a difference. Yeah, and first of all, I got to apologize. Today's podcast is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. I forgot to put this in the rundown. Go over to FanDuel.com slash locked on today to learn more and uh, be in the moment with FanDuel. All right, so now that that's done, let's get back into this. So the starting pitching battle is the most important because the old adage is good pitching beats good hitting, i.e., if you're not sure you're going to have good hitting, like we're hoping that the Reds have good hitting, but last year they didn't. So there's probably a little bit of a maturation process with the lineup that's going to take place this year. But if you're not sure you're going to have good hitting, at least be able to pitch well. And that is why we look at the pitching rotation battle and we say that is where this all should be focused. Like if you were to ask me, when it comes to spring training, what is the one thing that we need to know? We need to know who the fourth and the fifth starters are. We cannot enter the season with the feeling that we have now. Now, I will say, I feel like this has been slightly, I'm not saying that it is narrowed down, but I do feel like the Reds have kind of narrowed this down a little bit for us with different guys who have pitched and things like that. And there's probably a little bit of overreaction going on with one of these guys that we'll talk about, but when it comes to the spring training position battles that going, I mean, the Reds have so many of them. This is where it starts. That's absolutely right. And listen, when you say they need to break camp, knowing who the fourth and fifth starters are, uh, this is not one of those, those things where they just going to pick the, the best two of a bad bunch. There's going to be some, yeah. some decent starters come out of this competition. And I really hope it, it's a situation where they don't prioritize uh, somebody that started before versus somebody that's pitching better. Uh, I hope they just take the best two guys out of Goodyear for the rotation. Uh, there's a lot of names on this list, uh, uh, and I'd be interested to see who uh, you're willing to eliminate already. I think we're both in agreement, though, that this conversation starts with Brandon Williamson and yes. is in his ability to either uh, cement a spot in the as the number five guy in the rotation or simply prove that he's not ready for prime time he absolutely has the most upside of anyone on this list and that includes any other rookie i think as well now we you know we've heard good reports about connor phillips out of camp there was an inquirer article about that he's not in this competition he's probably not going to be in the majors until at the very earliest i would say probably even september if at all this season so as much as the upside that they're reporting for him is amazing. When you look at the guys competing for a spot now, Brandon Williamson has the most upside and it's all about that combination of the fastball and the breaking ball that he is able to do. It's very Nick Lodolo esque. Now I don't think he has the ability to drop that back foot curveball just like Nick Lodolo does, but he's able to move the curveball around the zone and get people to whiff at it, which is huge. And when you talk about, you know, the, the pitching and why we need to figure this out yesterday. And I talked about this just a moment ago, yesterday underscored that because yeah, 
the Dodgers, they weren't playing their starters for the whole game, and then they weren't going crazy and all this other stuff. Let's make no mistake about it. The Dodgers roster is better than the Reds. And if you're able to set that team down and hold them to one run, that's something it's worth pointing out that if you can pitch really well, you can compete with anybody. So if the Reds can figure out their pitching staff this season, then you're talking about a big step in the how good are they going to be here and how quickly are they going to be good conversation. And it, it Brandon Williamson is the top guy for me because everybody else on this list is kind of like eh, a little bit of here, a little bit of there. Well, and and the thing with this is, Jeff, that it's not just one spot that we're looking to fill. There's two right. rotation spots up for grabs. Now, there has been some speculation that the Reds want a – uh, we say veteran. There's uh, just an experienced guy, an somebody quotes. that's done it before. Air quotes around all of that stuff. But, you know, basically that makes it uh, uh, just a couple guys competing for the four spot. We're talking about Luke Weaver or Luis Sessa. And I, I'm i starting to find myself in a camp where uh, I think Luis Sessa is going to be in the bullpen. Uh, yeah. The more I think about it, the more I look at it the more I try and evaluate what would be in the best interest of the team over the course of a 162 game season, the answer keeps coming up that that's Luis Sessa in this bullpen to kind of be a stabilizing factor out there with a lot of unknowns. Uh, I'm, I'm having a hard time moving off of that. Maybe you can convince me that Luis Sessa should be a starter. I'm not sure where you're at on this. Uh, Luke yeah. Weaver has been interesting in that he's put in a lot of work uh, since he was signed to prepare himself to be a starting pitcher, which makes me wonder if that wasn't discussed in the negotiations before the contract was ever signed. Like, listen, dude, we're bringing you in here to be a starter. Uh, we're not looking at you for the bullpen. And I know that's not exactly what they've said publicly, but Luke Weaver is acting like that's what they've said privately. I think. There's a little bit of truth that I, I think the way that they framed that though was okay, we're going to bring you in to be a starter, but you got to prove it. You got to prove that you can do it because obviously you proved to Kansas City that you can't. And if you're going to be a starter here, you got to work on a few things. And all of reports out of camp are he's been working really hard on a four pitch mix. We always talk about starting pitchers, they got to have an arsenal, right? It's like, the, the whole thing of having two really good pitches, but you don't really throw a third pitch is slightly concerning and that's why it's such a huge revelation that hunter green is really starting to control his change up like that's like huge huge thing there um when let's, it comes let's to dig Weaver, in on that a, for let's yeah, dig yeah. in on that for just a second with what you're saying so think about it from a hitter's perspective if you come into the batter's box and you're facing a guy that you know has two pitches you have a 50 50 shot of guessing correctly what that guy's about to throw you. Even if you're not good at pitch recognition, if you set up thinking, well, he's got a fastball and he's got a slider and I'm guessing slider here, you have a 50, 50 shot to be correct. Uh, as these starters add the third and the fourth pitch, you know, those odds are reduced dramatically and it allows the pitchers to get ahead of the hitters just by keeping them off balance. Yeah. And the good news is about the four pitch mix. They all break differently because there was always a concern I remember with uh, Luis Castillo that he had the four seamer, he had the slider, and he had like almost like a cut to his fastball. And then he changed it to a two seamer, and it just it transformed his game because it broke a different way. And then when you look at uh, Luke Weaver, he's got a four seamer, which probably, if anything, has a rise to it, a cut fastball, which goes one way, a change, and then a curve, which dips down. So all of this stuff just moves differently and, and and it falls under the factor of let's make sure the hitter has no chance of catching up with all of this and the one guy and i don't know that i would would necessarily say he's out of the running right now but his start to the spring training has not been um very inspiring has been connor overton and he is a guy that i think we fell in love with because the reds were struggling so mightily with their starting pitching whenever he came up last year and was really doing some good work for the Reds and the grand scheme of things, that was only like seven starts. So it maybe pump the brakes a little bit with the enthusiasm. I would love to see him take that fifth spot in the rotation, but if he's going to continue to pitch like this in the spring, like we said, spring training this year is a huge evaluation time. And if you're going to not play well during that evaluation time, it's hard for me to justify putting you in the rotation. 
I would like to point out that all through the off season and all through our ramp up to spring, I have never one time mentioned Connor Overton as the fourth or it's fifth fair. starter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there, and there's a reason for that. Uh, you know, I, I didn't get on that hype train last year like everybody else. I mean, in a season that was pretty abysmal and we were looking for bright spots, yeah, what Connor Overton did through those first six, seven starts that he made was a bright spot for this team. But it was a very, very small sample size, and it came out of nowhere, and the league didn't have time to adjust to Connor Overton before he was injured. Uh, they had time to watch film, and they had time to get their adjustments down before he came back. And there was a there was a good body of film to look at for when he came back and we saw what happened and I felt like they rushed him back a little bit and I was OK with that just in the circumstance and to help him kind of knock off the rust. Uh, what we've seen now out in Goodyear is that uh, maybe people have figured out how to hit Connor Overton and I, I hope that's not the case. Uh, I don't I'm not looking to him to be one of these starters. Uh, I think, uh, if anything, uh, long man in the bullpen ability yeah. to spot start. Uh, there's value there. Listen, you don't have to be a sub three ERA strike everybody out guy to be valuable to a team. If you're a solid long man that can get some guys out and limit damage and and fill in, in an emergency and not disrupt an entire pitching staff. That brings value to a team. And I think Connor Overton can be that guy for the Reds in 2023. I, I definitely agree. And I think kind of where we're going with this is that we like Luke Weaver and we like Brandon Williamson right now. We'll see how that continues to develop throughout spring training because the Reds need to get this pitching plan right to take that first step toward relevance. Do you know, Steve, not quite as important as pitching, but definitely next in line is figuring out this outfield. There may be a new name in the mix that we didn't talk about really at all this offseason, and we'll explain who that is coming up next. Before we get into that, though, I want to get into FanDuel. FanDuel is the official sportsbook of Locked On, and they are giving you a no-sweat first bet right now. If you go to FanDuel.com slash Locked On, you can get a no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000. Now, what's that mean? That means you can place a bet of up to $1,000, and if it doesn't win, you will get free bet credits in return that you can then place wagers on other things. And as the NBA season is going along, we're, we're past the midway point. The Lakers just lost LeBron James. Don't know that the Lakers were doing much with them anyway, but you know, that, that that's a big thing for them. And then we've got all the wonderful futures. When you're talking about major league baseball, you can bet on division winners. You can check out award winners and see where everybody lands. I know we've talked a little bit about where Hunter green and Nick Lodolo are in regards to the Cy Young race. There's really no odds on any Reds winning the MVP award. That could be interesting to see how that plays out in the first month if uh, somebody really takes off. But that being said, FanDuel is your number one spot to check out your next line as they've got an amazing, easy-to-use app. It is so great. Like if you are a seasoned gambler or if you are a new sports wagerer, especially as we get close to the NCAA tournament, FanDuel is your best bet. So go over to FanDuel.com slash locked on today and learn more about the no sweat first bet of up to $1,000 that you can get. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. You need to make every moment more with FanDuel. They are an official sports book of the NBA. And now that sports gambling is legalized in the state of Ohio, Locked On has the right podcast for you. Whether you're a new or seasoned gambler, you can make a few dollars by listening to Lee Sterling and your boy Q over on Locked On Bets. Locked On Bets is just like Locked On Reds, free and available on all platforms. All right, Steve, as we kind of look at the most important position battles of spring training, we, we obviously the pitching is paramount, but the outfield which is quite a hodgepodge has to also be figured out too. We've been very excited. And I, I know everybody is waiting for me to drop Will Benson's name in the show. And look at that. It took me a whole 14 minutes to say it today. So, you know, everybody can kind of breathe a little bit. I'm not going to inundate you with Will Benson talk today, but I've been happy with what I've seen from him. But as far as figuring out this outfield goes, especially in a world where Joey Votto may miss some time in the regular season, and Will Myers has to play first base sometimes, there's a lot going on. 
there's a whole lot going on and i know and we'll get to will benson and we'll get to center field specifically because uh one of the guys i really want to talk about uh could play that position mm-hmm. and jeff I- i've been really pleasantly surprised with the hustle with the aggressiveness with the energy that Friedel has brought to camp trying to position himself uh, as a guy on this team. Uh, He very well could play his way into a lot more playing time than I was counting on for him, especially, uh, as you say, if Will Myers is playing first base, uh, there could be a situation where both Fraley and Friedel uh, could be starters against right-handed pitching. And I wasn't quite there in my head when we were talking about this, especially after uh, the Will Benson trade, but there could be all three of those bats could play versus is right-handed pitchers and that could be your starting outfield of, of Fraley, Friedel, and Benson. Yeah, I think both of us would be super excited about that because it's an all lefty outfield. That would be mm-hmm. phenomenal. Um, but yeah, TJ Friedel has really come out of the gate firing and he left yesterday's game early after getting hit by a pitch. But um Bobby Nightingale even noted in his tweet about it, he was just like he was about to come out of the game anyway. So this is probably just precautionary. There's been no more reports on that, so I'm not sure if there's anything more to come. I don't think It's going to be that bad. It's spring training. If anybody has got a bruise, you're just like, you know what? It's probably okay if you sit down for a minute. So I'm with you. I've liked what I've seen from Friedel. Haven't seen – I feel like Jake Fraley's only played in one game so far, so Mm -hmm. I don't know that I've seen a lot from him. But he's definitely – as far as the guys on the list, and and, you know, we'll talk about Will Benson in just a moment, but he's the, the guy outside of Will Myers that has the best chance to start the most games. Uh, he's yeah he's shown the power he's shown the athleticism he's shown the ability to field the only thing that we have questions about is if he can hit left-handed pitching they're not going to face lefties every day they're going to face a lot of righties yeah and I, so i watched him in the in the, his at bats against the dodgers uh yesterday and you know he looked comfortable he looked good in the box he had good bat speed uh, he did have a hit in the game uh, I think I think Fraley's fine. I think he's going to just do his work, and and he's going to be the the left handed part of the left field platoon. That's just the way that is. He that's who he's going to be. That's his spot already. Pencil him in. Uh, the question, as you say, is can they get him in there against any lefties, or do they even want to try to get him in there against any lefties? Uh, that's pretty much the only question he needs to answer uh, this spring. Yeah, the now the interesting part then comes, okay, what do they do against left-handed pitching? Because we know for a fact TJ Friedel cannot hit lefties. We know for a fact that Jake Fraley can't. And, 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 you know, there's an argument to be made on if you should give them a chance in a season where wins and losses aren't that big of a deal, but also put your team in the best position to succeed. So there are some right-handed guys on this roster. Nick Solak uncorked a homer the other day. I mean, he's a guy that... We've talked a little bit about, and there's been a couple of folks that were very enthusiastic about him after he came over from the Rangers in that trade. You've also got a couple of interesting names. Uh, and, and what do you do with Nick Senzel whenever he is finally healthy, whenever that could be? I feel like we've asked that question about 100 million times. Jeez, it's Groundhog Day. Anyway, um, and, and then you have another guy, a guy we have not talked about, and be, mostly because he was – just one of those non-roster invitee signings, and we didn't even include him in our episode of who could be the next Brandon Drury. But a guy who's passed the eye test early on in spring training is Henry Ramos, a guy who doesn't have a whole lot of history to him, and he's already 30 years old. He'll be 31 uh, in about, you know, I think it's like a month and a half or something like that. So we're not talking about a dude who could be here for the long haul, but could he be an interesting depth piece slash, you know, platoon guy? It's possible. And as you say, he, he has a very limited, limited amount of experience, 50 yeah. big league at bats, Jeff. And that was all for the diamondbacks in 2021. Yeah. So, I mean, he doesn't have a lot for, for you to look at and, and make an evaluation with uh, played overseas last year. I think you've got some stats on that coming up here in a second. Here, here's the big question. This is before, and it doesn't matter if we're talking about Henry Ramos, if we're talking about a waiver wire pickup towards the end of spring, whatever it is we're talking about. The big question we have to ask ourselves first is how many outfielders do we think the Reds will break camp with? Mm. Do we think they're going to take five outfielders to Cincinnati, which is what I think, or do we think they're going to take six? I, I Six is a big ask. 
uh, it makes me wonder more and more if one of these other guys, and we talked about this off camera and we haven't ever really dropped it into an episode yet, but it makes me wonder if someone like a Spencer steer should start to see a little bit of outfield time in Goodyear to be available as a right-handed bat in one of the corner outfield positions in a pinch. I think that's probably what's best for his future individually, because we talked about, you know, the best case scenario for Spencer steer and the way that he has set himself up is that he wants to be that utility guy. He wants to be able to move everywhere and play wherever the reds need him to play. And if he is going to kind of turn into that Ben Zobrist or even, I know I've used Ben Zobrist a lot. Let's, let's use a reds example. Let's go back to Miguel Cairo. You remember Miguel Cairo? He kind of moved around when the reds need him to, and he played pretty decently in those utility spots. So Maybe he can be, and and there's going to be some somebody kill me for this because I think Spencer Steer is better than Miguel Cairo, but that's kind of the role I envision him in, and maybe get him some at bats and left field and stuff like that. Because you're right, it's it's hard to envision. So let's let's pretend they break camp with six. You've got Will Myers, you've got Will Benson, you've got T.J. Friedel, you've got Jake Fraley. That's four. Mm-hmm. Um, is Nick Senzel healthy? That could be your fifth guy. And then are you talking about Nick Solak? Are you talking about, I mean, who that sixth guy is, I think has to have some positional flexibility in his own mm-hmm. right. Yeah, absolutely. And and listen, I do remember Miguel Cairo, and I also remember Pedro Guerrero. I do a lot better at remembering the, <laughs> I do a lot better at remembering. Old one of them was a do. red Steve. The other one wasn't. <laughs> but but bringing this back around so so to where you're going with this could henry ramos be a contributor on this team a, a lot of it depends on nick senzel i think that's the yeah. question that really has to be answered uh david bell said uh just a few days ago that nick senzel was already cutting it pretty close as far as making this team right out of camp uh not not making the team, but being available to the team, being whether or not he was going to be right. on the injured list, healthy. Uh, I'm starting to think, you know, we still haven't seen Nick Senzel in the game. If we don't see him by, let's say, the weekend, I think he starts the season on the injured list, which frees up a spot for a Henry Ramos to come in and at least temporarily uh, show, some, show us something at the big league level. Yeah, and... I mean, we're talking about this is the make or break year for Nick Senzel. So any time spent on the IL is just going to be, it's not going to be great for him. I, I I hate that for him because I would love for him to prove us wrong, but it just continues to follow this same narrative we've seen ever since he's been called up. But look, when we're talking about this roster, the outfield is a must. So far as figuring out who is the future, it's a must figure out in 2023. Well, Jeff, uh, there was an injury in baseball this week, and you have decided that uh, there is a trade opportunity here. And I will just say for the listeners coming up, Jeff's going to tell us uh, how the Reds may or may not be able to take advantage of another team's misfortune and and make it an opportunity for themselves. He hasn't told me what he has in mind, so you can watch along and listen along in real time as I scoff and react with disgust coming up right after this. You can follow the podcast on all platforms, including right here on YouTube. Uh, If this is your first time, thanks for watching today. Uh, If you're on our audio feeds, thanks for listening. Uh, If you're on YouTube, click subscribe and notification bell so that you get notified every time there's a new episode. Uh, Also, make sure you are following us on Twitter between shows. You can follow me at S. Offenbaker with two Fs. You can follow Jeff at Jeff Carr with three Fs. And you can follow the show at Locked On. Reds. All right, Jeff, you want to talk trade, and we all saw that the Dodgers uh, experienced a significant loss uh, very early now in spring training. Uh, They are going to be looking to basically find themselves a new second baseman as Lux has the ACL tear that's going to keep him from playing baseball at all, which is terrible in 2023. So what do you got for me? Yeah, so this is something worth thinking about because the Dodgers didn't do anything really this offseason. I mean, they signed J.D. Martinez. J.D. Martinez is mostly going to DH for them. And they already kind of had some questions. It's like, you know, who's going to play third base? They lost Justin Turner to the Red Sox. Um, they, they They already had a couple of holes in their starting lineup. Now they have a huge hole because Gavin Lux was going to play second base. And so now they don't have that. He's not going to play at all this year. And as good as their farm system is, they don't 
have a ready made solution to come in there, step in and play second for them. So, and, and I think most every team in major league baseball, if they're trying to be opportunistic are going to be looking at this. Could the reds take advantage of this opportunity? Nick crawl has been pretty good about taking advantage of some different opportunities like this. Now this would be, and, and, and bear with me while I flesh out this thought, because there's part of me that doesn't like this thought, but there's part of me that thinks it could work. Jonathan India for Andy Pajes and Diego Castillo. Both of them top 10 prospects for the Dodgers. Pajes is ready now. I think Diego Castillo is close. I would have to do a little bit more research on that. Diego Castillo is a catcher. So you get an outfielder for the future to go with Will Benson, and you get Diego Castillo, who becomes your catcher. Tyler Stevenson can move to first. And then you can move Matt McClain to second base. So the Dodgers have been pretty reluctant to even discuss the idea of trading those guys, correct? Right. You know, if that's the deal, if the deal, if, if all the Reds have to send is Jonathan India, you know, I might be in on that. Um, bearing in I mind that it's gonna it's gonna create chaos within the team yeah, again, just like we saw at the beginning of last spring training. But that, that's I would one do one. that deal. I think I would do that deal. Um, I, if that's the deal, if we don't have to send anybody else, um, I might be in on that. It's one of those deals that like. You know, when you're playing fantasy sports and you're going to make a trade and you're just like, boy, this feels good, but this also feels bad. And like, I think in the terms of real life baseball, this might actually be bad because he's talked about becoming that leader, becoming the guy that guys can kind of follow along with in the clubhouse. Yeah, we might, we might really upset the, you know, might upset the apple cart here if this kind of trade were to happen. But I think like on paper, the void of emotion and human you know, feelings and things like that. I think on paper, this trade works for both sides because it fills the hole and it fills the hole for many years for the, uh, for the Dodgers. And then they could also figure out what the, cause Gavin Lux can play multiple spots as well. I can talk myself into it, but I can also talk myself out. I can't wait to read the comments on this episode. <laughs> there's there's going to be so many comments, Jeff. Listen, I mean, I, Oh, emotional. My, 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 my heart says to argue with you hard, but you're right on paper. That's actually not a bad deal. I think there could be a, some unintended consequences. It's real unfortunate that Nick Senzel is not healthy right now. Cause this yeah, could have been the, the perfect guy. opportunity to flip him for a mid-level prospect out to Los Angeles, get him back on the infield where he probably should be anyway, and let him get a fresh start with a change of scenery. Uh, that would have been perfect, but the dude hasn't taken in at bat yet. So yeah. once again, it, injuries screw the Reds. <laughs> I think the only trade that they can make would be for like a, a flyer of a prospect that nobody's really going to put in anybody's top 30, which the Dodgers farm system is one of the best in baseball. So who knows? Maybe a deep prospect in the Dodgers system becomes a top 30 prospect in the Reds. Um, but yeah, Nixon's L would be tough. I saw some folks being like, what about Kevin Newman? It's like, what about him? We don't know anything. About him. I, I know he can field. I, I don't know if he can do anything else. And I don't think that that's what the Dodgers are looking for. Like, I think they're looking for somebody like they're they if if the Dodgers and looking from the Dodgers perspective here, the only reason they make a trade is if it moves their needle. And I saw, mm -hmm. you know, when you 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 look at the different comments and, and the quote tweets and all this other stuff, um, I saw somebody suggest like a big trade. I think it was, I think it was from Minnesota or something like that. And it was, or no, 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 Milwaukee. That's who it was. It was Milwaukee trading. I think it was Colton Wong and Corbin Burns. And I'm like, well, <laughs> that, that definitely takes the Reds out of it because Reds ain't offering anybody else, but the one guy they no. offer. Well, remember, he is Jeff with three F. So tweet us what you think about this particular trade. Uh, use the hashtag, hashtag Jeff hates Jonathan India. That's Jeff no, with three Fs. No, That's don't. Jeff with three Fs. Also drop into the YouTube comments and tell us what you think about Jeff hating Jonathan India. So that is probably not. where we want to wrap it up for today, Jeff.
Oh, uh, why did I why did I suggest this? This is me. I should have had a better filter on my brain mouth thing. Jonathan Indy, I love you if you're watching, I promise. <laughs> I don't want you to be this is more just yeah, whatever. Fantasy baseball stuff. <clears throat> That's where we're gonna end today's podcast. I can't wait Thank till you so his much. dad calls you out on Twitter. <laughs> I mean, I'll take a jersey. That that's okay. Um, <laughs> that bombshell is where we're going to end. Thanks everybody for watching. Thanks for listening to today's Locked On Reds podcast. Uh, thanks for making us your first listen. Now make your second listen to Locked On Fantasy Baseball podcast. They'll talk about how you can win your fantasy baseball league by making interesting trades that don't have real life consequences for those players. And uh, because Matt and Dom are also going to give you some strategies for your drafts to help you win your league. That's locked on fantasy baseball, just like locked on reds. It's free and available on all platforms. And it's part of the locked on podcast network because we are your team every day. Steve, Jonathan, Indy is mad at me now. I'm sure he is. What's that mean for you and me? Well, congratulations on not even making it to the first game of the season before uh, alienating most of the fan base. Solid work from you today, Jeffrey. Uh, what people can expect from us is to remain locked in on the rumors, locked in on the transactions, uh, locked in on the waiver wires so that we can report back to each and every one of you and keep you locked on Reds every single day. I promise. You're in so I much trouble. That. I promise. <laughs>